In the fall of 2020, the Omnia team brought you In These Times, a podcast that used COVID-19 as a platform to go deep on issues like healthcare inequality, political polarization, and the climate crisis. We're currently working on a second season dedicated to racial justice to be released later this spring. In the meantime, we're here with a bonus episode responding to the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. In this episode, we talk to a constitutional scholar and a professor of sociology and Africana studies about the events and what comes next. The U.S. Capitol has been placed on lockdown as angry protesters surround the building. We should note that the House and Senate have halted debate on objections to the Electoral College vote, and they have gone into recess. Senior members, including the Vice President Mike Pence, have been rushed from the floor. On Wednesday, January 6, 2021, as legislators counted and confirmed the votes in the Electoral College, rioters breached the Capitol building forcing an evacuation of the House floor, including Vice President Pence. The events unfolded amidst President Trump having urged his supporters to fight against the ceremonial counting of the votes. The rioters, who could be heard calling police officers traitors, eventually forced their way into the Senate chambers. The standoff resulted in five deaths. There's no real precedent for private citizens taking over the Capitol building in the ways that we witness. We've had violence in the Capitol before. Uh, We had Puerto Rican nationalists shooting congressmen in the 1950s. We've had violence amongst members of Congress as uh, most famously when Preston Brooks of South Carolina caned Charles Sumner of Massachusetts in the Senate chamber. But we have not had a takeover of the building by private citizens. Those were British troops in 1812. So this really is an unprecedented event. Roger Smith is the Christopher H. Brown Distinguished Professor of Political Science and a constitutional law scholar. He is the author of eight books and scores of major essays on American political ideology, civil rights, and constitutionalism. The events of January 6th were precipitated by the suggestion that Vice President Mike Pence had the ability to reject certification of the Electoral College results. Smith discusses whether this scenario was plausible. As a political scientist, as a citizen, and as a non-lawyer, I might add, I have always taken the view endorsed by Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln, and many others, uh, that the Constitution is something that all citizens of the United States are entitled to interpret in judging their government and in deciding on their own civic duties. Having said that, the particular interpretation that was being put forth that the vice president of the United States has somehow been empowered by the 12th Amendment unilaterally to decide what electoral college results are valid and which are not, this is one of the most preposterous arguments that has ever been advanced in uh, American constitutional discourse. There's simply no way that makes any sense at all on any plausible version of the Constitution or constitutional democracy. Uh, So I think that that particular argument will be embedded in the dustbin of history very rapidly. Senator Ted Cruz of Texas called for a 10-day audit of the Electoral College votes, citing the Hayes-Tilden presidential race of 1876, after which Congress appointed an electoral commission to address charges of voter fraud. Professor Smith provides historical context. Well, the differences vastly outweigh the similarities, although it is the only election that's uh, remotely comparable in U.S. history. Uh, The uh, 1876 situation occurred when the uh, Republican Party, uh, through the federal government, Uh, had reconstruction governments in place in several Southern states that were being ardently resisted by the white Southerners who had supported the Confederacy. One big thing that's changed since 1876 was that in those days, uh, the federal courts uh, 
almost always refuse to get involved in election disputes, regarding those as political questions to be settled by uh, the elected branches of government. Now we have, uh, really since the 1960s, had a pattern of federal courts frequently being involved in election disputes, and uh, the country has accepted that role so that unlike the Hayes-Tilden dispute, uh, the disputes over the elections this year have gone to court over and over again, nearly 60 times. And uh, there have been no successful efforts to show uh, fraud or uh, uh, any really serious misconduct of these elections of any sort. So there's a whole judicial record that wasn't present in 1876. I'll also note that the members of that uh, commission in 1876 uh, did vote uh, a straight party line on the disputed the re results uh, with the Republicans winning by one vote, allowing Hayes to take the White House. Uh, this did not uh, create an air of legitimacy about the result. It was seen as a partisan result, and it's commonly thought the Democrats accepted it only uh, because the Hayes people made what is often called an infamous bargain uh, to agree to withdraw military troops and those reconstruction governments from the southern states if uh, the Democrats would accept the result of the election, uh, which uh, the Democrat Samuel J. Tilden uh, had won um, in the popular vote by a significant margin in the ensuing years as uh, white Southerners regain control of those states, which they referred to as redeeming the states. But what they meant by that uh, was restoring systems of white supremacy in those states, uh, which included the spread of Jim Crow segregation laws, uh, the exclusion of African-Americans from juries, and most significantly uh, of all, uh, the disfranchisement of millions of African-Americans in the South. Uh, those were results of the bargain uh, that won acceptance for the results of the 1876 election uh, commission. Uh, and they are results uh, that have burdened American democracy uh, right up to the present day. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer are among hundreds of members of Congress who called upon Vice President Pence to invoke the 25th Amendment, used to remove a sitting president. Smith discusses the protocol for such an action and whether there's any precedent. Vice President Pence uh, has reportedly refused to invoke the 25th Amendment, although uh, on Wednesday afternoon, when President Trump refused to call out the U.S. National Guard, uh, Vice President Pence did so. And so there's some evidence that they were operating tacitly around the president as if the 25th Amendment had been invoked. And I think that's probably the way Vice President Pence uh, prefers to do it. And uh, that's what he will do unless the president uh, does something so egregious that um, the 25th Amendment seems necessary. Vice President Pence is the lead figure in invoking the 25th Amendment, uh, the vice president and the majority of the cabinet members have to send notice uh, to the leaders of Congress that the president is unable to continue in office. Then the president has an opportunity to reply and say, no, I'm perfectly fit. And then the vice president and a majority of the cabinet have to come back and say, no, he isn't either. And then it goes to the two chambers of Congress to decide, and you need a two thirds vote in both the House and the Senate uh, in order to find the president unable to continue in office and elevate uh, the vice president to the president's uh, powers and responsibilities. And achieving uh, the two thirds majority in the House in particular uh, is going to be extraordinarily difficult. So since um, at this point, there's less than a dozen days till uh, inauguration. I think it's unlikely the 25th uh, will be invoked. House Democrats introduced articles of impeachment on January 11th, citing incitement of insurrection. 
Professor Smith elaborates on whether a successful impeachment would disqualify President Trump from running from office in any form in the future. That is a question that has never been decisively answered, uh, but the question is not whether Congress can, through the impeachment process with conviction, prevent the president from ever being eligible for the presidency again. They can do that. The question is whether that happens automatically with impeachment and conviction or whether it's necessary for them to specify the ineligibility. Um, And in the late 19th century, there were some indications uh, that a president could be impeached in conviction but remain eligible to run again. Uh, The Constitution makes it clear, however, that if uh, the uh, Congress wants to make the president ineligible for uh, future office, uh, they can do so. There have been reports that President Trump has inquired about whether a president has the power to self-pardon. Smith discusses the constitutionality of such an action and whether there's any precedent. There is no precedent for a presidential self-pardon and constitutional scholars are debating uh, whether the pardon power is so extensive or not. There are no explicit restrictions placed on the pardon power in the Constitution. Uh, So that you can argue that uh, in theory, it is possible. Uh, The pardon power would extend only to crimes already committed. Uh, The president would not be in a position uh, to pardon himself or herself from any future crimes. That uh, is not something uh, the pardon power uh, could extend to. It's a pardon for acts already committed. A pardon can be used as a blank check almost. You don't have to specify the particular crimes for which you're being pardoned. And the rationale for that is that you can't know in advance exactly what the specific charges will be. Uh, so the pardon is allowed to say that, you know, whatever charges are brought for um, these activities, say, uh, on January 6th, no prosecution is possible. Now, this clearly involves the president being the judge in his own case, and there is a long-standing maxim in Anglo-American law that no person should be a judge in his own case. And so that's the reason uh, why some argue that a self-pardon should not be viewed as uh, constitutional. Professor Smith analyzes the effectiveness of President Trump's policymaking and how it will affect his legacy. I think that uh, Trumpism, the set of policy positions that Donald Trump stood for and uh, did so pretty consistently, uh, will remain a potent combination in American politics. Um, In some ways, as I've been stressing, they uh, go back to the Republican Party positions of the 1920s. And those positions included uh, low taxes, uh, little governmental regulation, uh, but at the same time, immigration restrictions and uh, the use of tariffs as a foreign policy instrument. Um, Though that package departed from the post-World War II Republicans that mostly emphasized uh, free trade um, and many supported free movement of labor, immigration uh, as well. I think that the Republicans going forward are going to continue the Trump package, uh, which um, in the eyes of uh, most Trump supporters uh, has been very successful as a set of policies uh, for the United States. Um, And I I think, therefore, uh, Trumpism uh, will remain a a significant phenomenon in American political development uh, and one uh, that many Americans will see as a success. Professor Smith has spent his career examining impactful political events throughout history. He reflects on the significance of January 6th in the long term. I don't think that there's any doubt that uh, January 6, 2021, will be known as one of the most infamous days in American history. It will be seen as a great failure of American constitutional democracy uh, that a mob was allowed to occupy the Capitol and uh, delay, uh, but not prevent, uh, the certification of the election of the President of the United States. 
Uh, this is a major event that will not be forgotten. If we have uh, patterns of uh, violence reflecting the deep divisions in this country uh, that we're not capable of uh, dealing with successfully, uh, reducing, uh, eventually eliminating, then this will be seen as the beginning of the breakdown of American constitutional democracy. And it really will be uh, for uh, the people of this country uh, to decide in the years ahead uh, what the significance of January 6, 2021 really proves to be. Much of the conversation in the days since the attack on the Capitol has focused on reactions to the powerful and disturbing images of that day, a Confederate flag outside the Senate floor, a law enforcement response that could only be described as muted in comparison to what we've seen in cities across the country during a summer of protests in defense of Black lives. Commenting on these images and what they have to say about the state of our country today is Takufu Zuberi. He's the Lassery Family Professor of Race Relations and a professor of sociology and Africana studies. A demographer by training, his work focuses on African and African diaspora populations, and more broadly, on race. In addition to his work as a traditional social scientist, he examines culture and society through documentary films and has curated several museum exhibitions. Here's Professor Zubiri commenting on the symbolism of what we saw on Wednesday, January 6th. A Confederate flag in the Capitol on the Senate floor in 2021. How did it happen? Why did it happen? That's what's at risk in this country. Do you go back to the 19th century and those racist thoughts or do you go forward to a world in which diversity of human experience human cultural articulation, human contributions to making the world a better place tomorrow. Do you go forward to that world or do you go back? So there's a struggle right now and people are struggling to define what the future of the United States would be. But now we know, okay, that that depends on how we interpret the past. It's no accident that when they invaded the Capitol, that one of the gentlemen had on his shoulder a Confederate flag. The Confederate flag symbolizes the slave owners in the Civil War. It's no accident that he would be there protesting for making America great again, just to give you where the historical points are for his Make America Great. People look at those who are the obvious descendants of the enslaved as if they are second class citizens. It's the only way the police would treat those two groups of people different. One calling about Black Lives Matter, which the police should be 100% for. And the other talking about Make America Great Again is two different interpretations of the same past. And these different narratives are leading us to a point of destruction. While the Confederate flag was an overt symbol of attachment to a racist past, the images documenting the rioters' easy access into the Capitol and their freedom to exit were emblematic of the continuing impacts of that destructive legacy. Can you imagine a group of African-American men attacking the Capitol? How would they get out of the building? Police would not have been opening the doors and fanning them through. What we think that Capitol represents to America was violated. That violation necessitates a positive response from us. How do we educate this next generation not to be so ignorantly arrogant? 
How do we create another generation that will confront the bigotry that's in front of us so that the future looks like something we want our great grandchildren to live in? The United States is in need of reconciliation. To reconcile with its future, it will need to change how it looks at its past. To move forward as a nation of a people who think they related to each other, you will have to change the narrative of the past to be more inclusive of the voices left out. This concludes our bonus episode of In These Times. We'll be back with season two towards racial justice this spring. The Omnia podcast is a production of Penn Arts and Sciences. Special thanks to professors Roger Smith and to Kufu Zubiri. I'm Alex Shine. Thanks for listening.